Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's edition of the Seekers Forum. I hope you're having a great weekend. And let us say hi to Jay. How are you doing, Jay? Hey, good to see you, Mark. Doing well. Thank you. Good. Welcome. So we're going to be looking this month at the healing power of narrative and how it is that the stories we tell about ourselves come to shape our identity in the way that they do, for better or for worse. So let's start at the beginning. We come into this world nameless and wordless, without any narratives, without any labels. Until about the age of seven months, a child can't identify the word that people are using to call it, to name it. And until that time, until seven or eight months old, kids live in a, a kind of innocence uh, in a world that is unmediated by language. The absence of words attached to things has allowed them to simply be present, to be who they are in that moment, in that environment. But this blessed state, of course, doesn't last long. Because no sooner does the child realize that this word that people are using toward it is who they think it is, that the child latches onto that word like a kind of an anchor to stabilize itself in the world. And that's when the trouble begins. That begins a lifelong process of constructing a self to go with that name, to go with that label. As the stories multiply, as the ideas and the beliefs multiply, the child's ideas about who it is become established with age. That image forms in its mind and hardens and starts to set. Before we know it, this self-image becomes to the child inseparable from who it believes itself to be. If you ask little Jane what the difference is between her name and who she is, she won't know what to say. I'm Jane, she'll say. That's me. She won't see any sunlight between the name and the flesh and blood girl she actually is. In time, this self-labeling becomes the primary obstacle to Jane's self-awareness. And this is the true meaning of the fall in spiritual terms to original sin. If we understand sin in its original meaning of missing the mark, okay, this is how we begin to miss the mark in our lives. This mistaking of our story for ourselves constitutes our fall from grace and innocence. It's the substitution of language for reality that hides our essential spiritual nature from us and prevents us from being fully present and connected to life itself. But, of course, this happens at such a young age that nobody realizes it. The custom of labeling ourselves and finding identity in our labels and in our stories is so universal that we're not even aware of its harmful effects or how our names mask the true mystery of who we are. We ignore it, you could say. And this ignorance, this fall into an alternate reality, is what blinds us to our true nature. And it also causes nearly all of our suffering as human beings. Ignoring who we essentially are creates separation, polarization, competition, conflict, cruelty. So much of the pain that we experience in our lives comes from that imagined separation between our naked self, our naked storyless self, and the rest of the world. When we mistake our true self for this neurotic little me self, the self-enclosed story made up of memories and beliefs and expectations, we lose our original joy and we lose our connection. We don't lose it, but we misplace or forget our connection to spirit. Because at the core of all spiritual life, in all of its forms and guises, is an invitation to remember our true identity. Seekers are people who long to remember our original nature, to be reunited with ourselves free of the stories that we have used and other people have used to confine us. When we ask the question, who am I, which is the question at the center of all self-inquiry, it's not our name 
or our biography that we're inquiring about. It's our essential nature, of course, that we're looking for. We're trying to reach beyond our worldly identity so that we're able to look in the mirror and see ourselves bare without any narrative armor. That is the meaning of spiritual freedom, being able to move through the world ambidextrously, you could say, as both the character you are playing and the being behind the character that's unencumbered by its name and by its story. It's a tricky practice, but it's also incredibly liberating. And it's also the only way that story doesn't become a straitjacket. Having a spiritual awareness within the story is the only way it's not going to end up constricting us and deceiving us into believing that we are completely defined by the superficial facts of our lives. For example, two of my dear friends, both of them in their 60s, recently changed their names. It happened all of a sudden. They both decided to change their name within weeks of one another. One of them told me when I asked her that she no longer wanted her slave name. She associated that old name with an identity that was connected to suffering, violation, violence, and pain. The other one responded by saying that he just no longer felt like that other person, that, that he had outgrown his biography, so to speak. He didn't feel like him anymore. Both of them wanted to transcend their suffering story, their wounded story, and step into a healing story. Now, they seem happy with their choice, and that's wonderful. But it also raises very intriguing questions. The first is, what is in a name? What's in a name really? You know, how much does it define us? Some people think that it can create a tectonic shift in their lives simply by changing the moniker that they give themselves. But if you ask uh, the poets and philosophers, they'll tell you that changing your name really doesn't do much at all. Remember Shakespeare and Romeo and Juliet, you know, Juliet asking, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. Her lover is not his name. And of course, it's the name in that play that constitutes the whole problem, the whole conflict that turns that love affair uh, into a tragedy. So from a spiritual perspective, it feels like renaming things is of very little use changing stories in the hope that it will actually save our life or free us of our biography is questionable at best. But this really misses an important point. It's not that stories don't matter. It's not that names don't matter. Of course they do. But they don't matter in the way that we think that they do. That's a critical difference. So think about the placebo effect. It's a good comparison. A placebo is a substance or treatment prescribed more for its psychological benefit to the patient than for any physiological benefit, like sugar pills instead of Prozac. But placebos in themselves are nothing, except when they're invested with personal belief. That's when they have powerful effects. But it's the belief that creates the effect, not the placebo. It's the meaning that we give them in our minds that give placebos their power. And the same is true of the stories that we tell ourselves. You know, names and narratives mean nothing in themselves. There's no active ingredient there, you could say. There's no verifiable personal self. Instead, we come to see that we are actually verbs, not nouns. We are actually, each of us, a system of processing that takes place. Seeing, hearing, speaking, connecting, loving, touching, walking. We are verbs, we're not nouns. Emerson put it this way. He said, a man is a method, a progressive arrangement, a selecting principle, gathering his like to him wherever he goes. Man is a method, a progressive arrangement. So we're always growing. We are a selective principle that gathers his like to him wherever he goes. So what looks like us, to us, we gather to ourselves. What seems like not us, we push away from ourselves. And that's how we create this chasm that we imagine separates us from the rest of existence. So we're not, in other words, any kind of solid, separate self. 
We are, however, a distinctive principle that is manifesting uniquely in this particular body mind. There will never be a, another principle exactly like you. And even though this principle can't be contained by a story, it does have a certain consistency to it. It has a particular shape and way of moving through the world. Once again, poets and philosophers call this consistency by many different names, but always aware that it isn't what we believe it to be. Stanley Kunitz writes in his poem, The Layers, I have walked through many lives, some of them my own, and I am not who I was, though some principle of being abides from which I struggle not to stray. Some principle of being abides from which I struggle not to stray. William Stafford, in his poem, The Way It Is, puts it differently, but similarly. He writes, there's a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you're pursuing. You have to explain about the thread, but it is hard for others to see. While you hold it, it can't get lost. Tragedies happen, people get hurt or die, you suffer and get old. Nothing you do can stop times unfolding. You don't ever let go of the thread. So when we let go of the thread, we let go of our spiritual connection and we lose our personal power. But the thread is not the story. This is the, the important point. The thread is the selecting principle that is telling the story. That's the thread. And when you realize this, your life really does begin to change. It's a major step toward personal awakening because you're no longer imprisoned by your narrative. You see that the story is a device that you have control over. You could say the tail is no longer wagging the dog, T-A-L-E. The myth no longer manipulates you. Instead, you realize you're the maker of the placebo, you are the teller of the tale, and that it's within your power to change the story that you need for healing. In other words, you can become, through self-awareness and self-inquiry, a better storyteller. And that means understanding your character, your motivations, the nature of your thread, how you select, and, and then weaving that thread as beautifully, as helpfully, as passionately as you can into the fabric of the world. You no longer feel trapped inside magical thinking or victimized by your inherited stories. The distance from the narrative self, that stepping outside the narrative, is what separates what we're talking about from magical thinking. Magical thinking is not aware of its own devices. Magical thinking believes its own version of things and can invest its belief in that version of things, which can have a very powerful effect. What's missing is the awareness of what it's doing so that it becomes delusion rather than intentional imagination. This is a very different thing. As a writer, I understand this in a very particular way. I know that when I'm trying to tell a personal story, if I'm too identified with that story, the writing will lack depth and clarity. In fact, it will lack truth because I won't have any perspective. There won't be any actual distance, space between me and this Mark character. So that the writing, my perception becomes very limited. When I'm over-identified with the story that I'm telling, when I really believe that the story is who I am, the imagination collapses and you become trapped in the authorized version of things. And that's why self-inquiry matters, because it helps us take that backward step out of the yarns of our own personal myth into awareness of the true self. Asking ourselves essential questions helps us to separate the strands of fiction from the storyteller, that part of us that is watching and learning and choosing. When we ask ourselves, who am I, that central query of all self-inquiry, it becomes a doorway into the mysterious depths of our own being. It starts a process of what you could call disidentification, because the more we realize what we're not, the more clearly we become aware of what we are. Are we our feelings? No. Are we our thoughts? No. 
Are we our situation? No, of course not. When we come to identify with the one true spirit, our actual nature, it liberates us from the past. And it also enables us to enter the eternal story, the bigger story. We come to know ourselves as mysterious parts of an ineffable whole, not solitary objects revolving in our own universe and never able to actually connect with other people fully or with our own lives. So the question is, how can we live this eternal story, this healing story, as flesh and blood characters in the world? Now, how can we do that? It sounds terrific. But what are some of the methods for moving in that direction? I'd just like to suggest a few clues to use and a few practices. The first is to find a practice for silencing the mind. Okay? Whether it's contemplation, whether it's yoga, whether it's meditation, whether it's walking through nature, whether it's staring at a blank wall, it doesn't matter. As the mind settles, we practice stepping outside of language. You know what I mean. When your mind is quiet, when that chatter starts to subside, it's like you're stepping out of the language dimension of reality into suchness, isness, presence, reality. Number two, notice the arbitrary nature of every single label that you use to describe yourself. Every single one. In response to the question, who am I, you can use the process of elimination, which has long roots in the Advaita tradition of ancient India and other traditions of self-inquiry as well. For example, when Ramana Maharshi, who was one of the great sages of the 20th century, was asked by a student, who am I, this is what he replied. The gross body, I am not. The five cognitive sense organs, I am not. The organs of speech, locomotion, grasping, excretion, and procreation, I am not. Even the mind that thinks, I am not. So the student asks, if I'm none of these, then who am I? And this is what the master replied. After negating all of the above mentioned as not this, not that, the awareness that alone remains that I am. After negating all of the above, the awareness that remains that I am. This is the deepest spiritual truth that runs throughout the perennial philosophy and really is part of the mystic core of, of all of the world's spiritual traditions. The understanding that I am that, tatvam asi, that thing that can't be named, the unnameable, is what we truly are. The third practice is that with this newly opened awareness, start to consider the narrative that you have created to describe yourself. Look at the story from all angles and start to notice how illusory it actually is, how full of holes. You can do this through writing or speaking into a tape recorder or, or, or even speaking to a trusted friend or, or a teacher. It doesn't matter. But examining the story that we tell about who we are from as many angles as possible, as clearly and unflinchingly as we can, is very, very important. That helps us to become cognizant of how attached we are to the details of our story. So notice, where are you attached to the details? You know, how inseparable are you from your memories? If you believe that you are your memories, do you believe that who you are is made up of these biographical criteria in your life? When you notice what you're attached to in the story, don't push the attachment away. Don't push the tender feelings away or try to think them out of existence. Just notice what you cherish and what you impulsively reject or resist. This will tell you a lot about how you define yourself and how you imprison yourself. The next thing is once you're grounded in that awareness, start to imagine seeing and understanding your own story in a healing way. Imagine looking at yourself through the eyes of God, through the eyes of beauty, through the eyes of love. Imagine framing your story in such a way that you are not a victim. You are not ashamed. You're not a sinner. 
you're not inauthentic or unappreciated or disappointed or lonely or needy or afraid. That's not who you are. That's your version of things. And finally, as you do this, notice how it feels in your body. Take note of the tension or resistance that is connected to releasing painful beliefs about yourself. These resistances, the senses you have in your body of holding on, are your narrative sticking points. They're the parts of the story that most need healing. They're the places where you're attached to your pain and where you define yourself by it. It's the wounds that you scratch at again and again, thinking that it's going to help you know yourself better when in fact all it does is prevents you from healing. Once you've done this, once you move through these practices, notice how much more alive and awake you feel without the overlay of this sad tale, this complicated history. Notice how self-pity has been your companion along the way, how in fact it has helped you to co-author your story and how much better you feel without it. Notice what inspires you, what expands your mind, what lifts your heart, and what dissolves the boundaries that you have erected between yourself and other people. And as you do this, remember to stay rooted in that silent awareness. That really is the key. Otherwise, every story you tell yourself will become a straitjacket if it doesn't factor in your spiritual identity. So being rooted in spiritual identity, however you do that, maintaining connection to that silence within, you can then play your character in the world. You can change how you look at that story without losing integrity and without losing authenticity and without losing connection to that part of you that is not named and never was that eternal part of who you are. So now I'd like to do a bit of writing. I'd like you please now to take 15 minutes to start to write about the aspects of your own story that need healing. What aspects of your story need healing and how do you resist that healing? Be as specific as you can be, please, and we'll come back together in 15 minutes. 